Hi everyone and happy World Ocean Day. We're so happy that you decided to celebrate it with us here today at Smithsonian Science How. We have an excellent guest today. His name is Dr. Mike Vecchione. And Mike, you are a scientist, a zoologist with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, NOAA, but you actually work here at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. That's right. Uh, NOAA has a small lab here. It's been here for a long time, since the 1940s. And we have several scientists and a few support people that work here at the museum. And then there are other federal agencies that have scientists here as well. Now, as a scientist here at the museum, you study some weird and pretty wonderful creatures, squids and octopods. That's right, the weirder the better. <laughs> <laughs> Do you study a specific um, type of squids and octopods? Uh, I focus on deep sea squids and octopods and their relatives like vampire squids and, and that sort of thing. So when you say deep sea, how deep are we talking? For a deep sea biologists like me, we're talking about uh, where, where it's deeper than sunlight can penetrate to, to uh, drive photosynthesis by the plants. So it's basically deeper than about 200 meters, but it's, most of the ocean is in the deep sea. So I'm a scuba diver. I know that you can only dive to 100 meters. So how do you actually get to 200 meters and deeper to be able to study these animals? Well, there are several tools that we use to study things, including submersibles. Of course, there are submersibles that people can get into and dive. There are also a lot of robot submarines now called ROVs, or Remotely Operated Vehicles. Which is what that, we see here. That's what you're seeing on the screen. The ROV uh, sends a feed up through a, a cable up to the ship, and then uh, the, it's being operated from people that are actually on the ship, but the ship can send the signal up through a satellite and back to shore again. And from the shoreside station, the, the feed from the robot sub can go out uh, over the internet so that anybody in the world with an internet connection can watch what's going on with that robot submarine. And as you just said, anyone with an internet connection can tune into these live feeds, and that includes us. That's correct. <laughs> and there is an exploration vessel out at sea right now off the coast of Canada, the Nautilus Live Group. And um, we're going to try to tune into their feed right now. Ah, here right. we are live. So, Mike, what are we looking at? This looks like um, I have this screen up to yeah. it's at 1,200 meters. Yeah, they're, they're still really deep down. Uh, what you're seeing is is water right now. <laughs> There's uh, some very small animals swimming around there, and then the two lines you see are parallel lasers that they use to measure things. And so you're seeing the, the lasers uh, as they go through the water. So Mike, that was just blue water, but as a scientist um, that studies deep sea cephalopods, this is the kind of feed that you watch from anywhere you are to be able to make some discoveries. That's right. I can't go out on every cruise that, that goes out to sea, but uh, for these telepresence dives, you can watch them from shoreside. And what you're seeing now is a, a squid, one of the animals that I study, uh, that actually attacked one of those submarines. It, it uh, grabbed hold of it and tried to see if it was good to eat. Wow, that's so fascinating. Now, that one wasn't live. That was from a previous cruise. Right, that's now, correct. How long do you have to watch these live feeds before a uh, squid or an octopod swims by? It depends on where they are and what they're doing. So the, what they're doing right now with that particular sub is, is servicing a, a deep sea uh, observation uh, observatory. Uh, so uh, you watch that for quite a long time before you can see an animal. But sometimes when they're doing transects, you see one thing after another, and they're, they're really interesting. So is there a community of people out there that can help alert you to when you should tune into this live feed as a scientist, since you can't spend all your time watching? There is a really good group on Facebook, which I think of as a citizen science group. And they are people all over the world who uh, watch these feeds from the submersibles. And uh, when there's something interesting, they, they capture a screen grab or a video of, of something. Like and that. Then, right, like that Dumbo octopod that you just saw. And they can post it on the Facebook group. And then if I uh, was eating dinner or something and missed it, I can go back to that group and see what was there. And I'll, I'll know there was something really interesting that I can then contact the ship to, to see the, the recorded video from. Wow, that's really fascinating. It really expands your capacity. Oh, yeah. Now, let's take a step back uh, for our viewers and visit what exactly squids and octopods are and uh, learn a little bit more about the group that they belong to. Can you tell us about the basic body plan of a cephalopod? Sure. The, uh, cephalopods are mollusks, so they're related to snails and oysters and, and things like that, but they have a very different kind of body plan. And I've got a couple of them out here. Uh, 
Well, what you see on the screen right now is that the, the basic body setups, there's, a, there's what we call a mantle or the body, which where the guts are, and then the head, which has eyes on both sides of it, and then an arm crown that would include at least eight arms with suckers on them, and some of them have two longer tentacles. So here's a, a squid in this case, which uh, I'll hold up and they can zoom in on it, and you can see this is the, the mantle right here. Here's the head with the eyes on it. And then the arm crown over here. And the arms, uh, there are eight arms plus two longer tentacles. So can you tell us a little bit about the diversity of cephalopods? We've been talking a little bit about squids and octopus that belong to cephalopod groups, but it's larger than that. Yeah, there are, there are a bunch of different species, but it's not a terribly speciose group. So there are about a thousand species. What there is is a great diversity in basic body plans, and uh, this would include things like the chambered nautilus, which has an external shell, uh, and then there are squids like that oceanic squid there, or this uh, coastal squid, reef squid. This is a cuttlefish, which has an internal shell, and this is called a bobtail squid. This one is called a ram's horn squid, which has a shell also, and this is a vampire squid and a dumbo octopod, and here is the, your your common octopus from coastal waters. Wow, they're all so incredible. Now let's yeah. visit some of those poll responses to learn a little bit more about the different um, characteristics of these cephalopods. Sure. I can't help, I can't ignore this gigantic eyeball mm -hmm. on the table. It yeah. is bigger than my head. That's right. <laughs> Who does this eye belong to? This is a model of a giant squid's eye uh, scaled to, to represent what we think is the the biggest giant squids. And so this is actually the largest eyeball in the animal kingdom. Wow. And, uh, they have an eye that's very similar to a vertebrate eye. It's a classic example of convergent evolution. So they have an eye with a lens that makes a, a, a image on a, a retina. It's very much like your eye or my eye, uh, uh, except that it doesn't come from the same evolutionary background as, as yours and mine. It's, uh, it's got very similar structure. And so all um, cephalopods have complex eyes? Yes, they, they do. Even the nautilus, which is the most primitive, uh, has a, a, a complex eye as well. Now, I really am just a fan of the octopus. It's one of my favorite animals, admittedly, and I like it so much because I think it's so smart. <laughs> and people think that a lot about um, cephalopods. Can you speak to their intelligence at all? Sure, they have a, a very large, well-developed brain. And if you think about the kinds of animals that are, you think of as intelligent, uh, that have a large brain, they're, they're all vertebrates. Now the cephalopod brain is shaped sort of like a donut, and it has an esophagus that goes right through the middle of it, unlike what you, found, you think of in the, uh, the uh, other types of intelligent animals like dolphins or parrots or any of the vertebrates. All of those have the same basic brain structure, but a cephalopod brain is based on the structure of a mollusk. And what are we looking at here? What we're looking here is, a, is an octopod, which uh, is pretending to be a floating piece of algae. <laughs> it looks like but, it's walking. <laughs> yeah, it's actually walking across the bottom with two of its arms. Uh, cephalopods, particularly octopods, have a lot of nerve cells in their brain, but they actually have twice as many nerve cells spread out throughout their body. And each of the arms in an octopus has sort of a mini brain so that if the arm is detached, in this case, then it's a species that can actually drop its arm like a lizard's tail. Uh, instead of just wiggling around like a lizard's tail, this, this arm is actually crawling around in the aquarium grabbing hold of things with the suckers and, and investigating the aquarium. Wow, it's so weird and pretty cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, the weirder the better. <laughs> yeah, so I know that they're also masters of camouflage. That's correct. Nothing does camouflage better than a cephalopod. And uh, they, they use both color changing and texture changing in order to change their appearance. So watch this rock as we get closer to it. It's covered with algae and then suddenly part of it turns into an wow. octopus. <gasps> Oh my goodness, I think I need to see that again. Sure. So walk I, us through I, I like this. What are we looking over over at here? Uh, what we see on the side of that rock is an octopus. It's pretending to be part of the rock with the algae growing on it. And then as the diver gets closer, it decides to become a big scary looking animal. 
That is just spectacular. And you really saw there the texture change. I mean, you really can't detect that there is anything but algae on that rock. That's right. They can match things very well. Now, they have camouflage abilities, but do they change colors um, for any other reasons? Yes, they, they can change colors in, as a, a way of responding to predators or in their environment or prey even. And they can also respond to a scuba diver, which is what's going on here. This is a reef squid flashing different colors to, to uh, startle a, uh, what it thinks might be a big predator. So speaking of prey and predators, so what, does, what do cephalopods eat? Are they predators? Do they actively hunt other animals? Yes, all cephalopods are predators. They, there aren't any plant eaters, but uh, different kinds hunt different types of animals. So uh, lots of, uh, uh, of different uh, species of fishes and crustaceans, shrimps and crabs are, are eaten by cephalopods. How do they eat them? They're very soft bodied. Do they have any mechanism? When they grab them with their arms, they have a, uh, in their mouth, they have a, a pair of hard structures called beaks. And they're, they're much like the beaks of a parrot, except when, when you look at them, and put them together, they're sort of upside down from the way a parrot is. So cool, we so have some beaks, who's... Um... This is a, these are the beaks from a giant squid. Ah, very cool. And this is the lower beak and the upper beak. And when they come together, the upper beak goes inside of the lower beak. So it's backwards from what a parrot does. Oops. There Over we go. There. And uh, when they come together, they, they're hard and sharp and they can bite off pieces of, uh, of flesh and that's how they get small enough pieces so that they're, uh, it can pass through their, uh, their brain to get uh, to their stomach. Right, because that esophagus, that tube that carries their food to their stomach is passing right through that donut-shaped brain. That's right. Now, what eats cephalopods? Lots of things eat cephalopods. And one of the, the most important predators of cephalopods are people. So there are, there are uh, fisheries for these things and you can find them on the menus at various restaurants but also a lot of fishes and uh, whales and dolphins and uh, birds, and lots of things eat uh, cephalopods. And so, or actually, we're seeing a video of what here? Is this cephalopod hunting? This is, yeah, this is an octopus. It's hunting along a, a reef type area. And what it's doing is spreading out its arms and webs uh, to cover a, an area and try and flush out small animals that it can then grab and eat. And is that, a typical hunting behavior? We have another this octopus a, here. Another kind of hunting behavior by an octopus where it sees a, a tasty looking shrimp there and is trying to sneak up on it, get close enough so they can grab it with that one arm with the suckers on it and then pull it into where the beak is wow. and, and bite it. So there it's crunching it up with that beak. That's right, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. And this is a cuttlefish and you'll see it sticks out its <laughs> tentacles and grabs its prey pulls them back into the beak. Those are just incredible videos. <laughs> I, they're, they're fascinating to watch. You really are. So it sounds like they eat a variety of foods and that a variety of things also consume them as you've already told That's us. That's right. They're really important in food webs. Now, are there any surprising predators of cephalopods? Um, I know we have a recent video from the Okeanos Explorer. Oh yeah, we, we got a video and uh, Okeanos was diving in the Pacific and they were watching a squid very close to the bottom and suddenly it was grabbed by a brittle star of all things. This is a, a relative of a, a, a sea star and it grabs this live squid and pulls it in, starts eating it and, and actually the other brittle stars came over to, to fight over who gets to eat the squid. <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of protein packed into that animal. Yeah, it's, they're almost all muscle. That was a, a squid that was a uh, crab tried to gra grab it there. This is from the Okeanos dives on uh, off of uh, New Jersey. And here we see a fish grabbing one of the squids. The squid is trying to get out of its mouth, but didn't succeed. <laughs> so Mike, you've given us a really nice overview of cephalopods and how their bodies are shaped and a little bit of um, information about um, what they eat and who eats them. But all of this knowledge, is that based on research done on deep water squids and octopods that you study right. or more shallow water species? Most of what we know about cephalopods comes from studies uh, that are in areas where there's a bunch of marine scientists that are close to a bunch of cephalopods. So they come from marine labs like Woods Hole in Massachusetts or the Naples lab in Italy or 
off of Japan. And uh, so it's all uh, uh, shallow water cephalopods. There's very little is known about the deep sea cephalopods, which is why I'm really interested in, in the cephal cephalopods from the deep sea. So we're gonna learn a little bit more about yeah. the discoveries you've made about deep sea cephalopods and okay. using some of this cool technology that you've already introduced us to. Okay. And kind of like this. Uh, this is a, a, an image from a very recent dive showing it, uh, a mated female of a weird deep sea squid holding something in its arms. It turns out that's another squid that's in its arms. And I suspect that what that is, is the male that, that she mated with. And what we may be seeing is a record of, uh, of cannibalism, where the, the female winds up eating the male, sort of like a praying mantis does. Wow, so yeah. fascinating. Mike, you're shedding a lot of light on what um, we're learning about cephalopods through all of your research um, with Noah in here at the Smithsonian. And one of the discoveries that uh, a ship made last year was of a little um, animal on the sea bottom that went viral, the googly-eyed squid, right. and you helped identify it. Yes. Can you tell us what we're looking at? Yes, this is a video from the, the Nautilus. And, uh, when they were diving in the Eastern Pacific, they saw this animal on the bottom. You can see why they called it a googly-eyed squid, but uh, <laughs> it actually <laughs> it looks, looks a startled. little like an octopus, but it's, it's, it actually has fins wrapped around the body there, and it's re related to squids. Uh, the thing that I wanted to point out about it is that it's different than what I thought uh, the best name that I could come up with for it. So that might be an undescribed species. Uh, and so that's really yeah. cool. That's a great example of how these live feeds, these ROVs that are out at sea exploring the ocean bot bottom can you give you can expand the capacity for you to discover new species. And not just you, but these um, ships are expanding capacity for geologists and chemists and other marine scientists to explore the ocean. That's right. Not everybody can go on every uh, offshore cruise. And I can... Uh, sit in my office and watch these these dives and still uh, have a, a life <laughs> in, in addition to being out at sea. Uh, also, the ships uh, can't hold that many scientists. So uh, by having telepresence uh, feeds, they can they can uh, interact with scientists all over the world at the, uh, as part of the one dive. Very cool. Yeah. Now, have you ever observed any truly unique uh, behavior uh, among deep ocean cephalopods? Yes, there's been a lot of different kinds of, uh, of unique behavior, but uh, one of the, the uh, most exciting was what you're seeing on the screen right now. This is uh, two deep sea squids. They're actually very large. They're over uh, three feet long. And it's a, a male holding on to a female. The male is actually upside down holding on to her and she's swimming around and it's mating behavior by these deep sea squids and nobody had ever seen this kind of mating behavior before. Wow, that's incredible. Now we wanna check back in with our viewers and ask them a question about how they would explore the deep sea. We see some of the techniques that you're using, but let's ask them. Okay. Viewers, here's another chance to participate in a live poll. Tell us, how do you study deep water cephalopods? Would you deploy robot subs, look at videos, consume or eat octopus and squid, research their DNA, or catch them in nets. Think about all of the techniques Mike has shared with us today and tell us what you think. We can see your responses still coming in, but we have some data to look at. Most people, 65% would deploy robot subs, but others would look at videos, research your DNA, and somebody even said that they would eat it. <laughs> yeah. the, the only kind of research that I would uh, put into that category is if you're trying to find out what they taste like. <laughs> um, it's, it's interesting that nobody put down catch, it, catch them in nets. Uh, we haven't talked about that yet, but that's still an important uh, method for studying the deep sea, and particularly uh, when you consider the thing above that, which is research their DNA. Uh, when you look at videos, you can learn a lot about behavior and, and uh, associations and that sort of thing. But if you need DNA, you have to actually catch the specimens in order to uh, get samples of them. And uh, having the specimens is important for other reasons as well. So uh, catching them in nets is still a very important tool for studying the deep sea. Mike, do you have an example where you have used specimens, video, and other sources of data to be able to make a discovery? 
Sure, one example is uh, when we described a brand new family of uh, squids a few years ago, a friend of mine in, the, in Hawaii had been working on plankton samples, baby squids, and got thousands of specimens, but there was one that he couldn't identify even to family. And then shortly thereafter, uh, I was working with colleagues in uh, the National Marine Fishery Service and got a similar specimen from another plankton sample, which you see a drawing of right there. They have very large fins and very strange arms and tentacles. And, uh, so we actually uh, decided that what we were dealing with was a, an undescribed family of squids, which is an, an unusual discovery. And then we got another specimen that uh, had been collected a long time ago and, and was donated to the museum from a, a, a collection. And this is a photograph that was found in the records from that collection. And um, we were able to actually find that specimen, which came out of a fish's stomach. And uh, so we had three specimens and described this new family. Then after that, uh, there was a, uh, an oil company, ROV, working in the Gulf of Mexico. And they, they came across this really weird squid. And the, a guy on the, uh, the ship gave the video to his girlfriend who was interested in marine biology. And she tried to find somebody who could tell her what it was. And nobody could. Wow. And this is what we're seeing from the oil rig. Uh, yeah, she contacted me here at the museum and said, are you interested in a video of a 21 foot long squid? And I thought, <laughs> wow, that's got to be a giant squid. I'll, I'll be the first one with a video. It turned out it was even weirder than a giant squid. And uh, we finally were able, through more videos and uh, a few specimens that have been collected, we're, we connect we connected those to the baby squids that we used to describe the new family. And so we were able to put together a fairly complete picture based on a lot of different sources. Of and when you identified this animal, it really made headlines around the world. Uh, yeah. When, <laughs> when we described these, uh, these submersible observations, I spent the, the whole next week just talking to the press about the, the discovery. And it got into a lot of different sources of information, including uh, uh, tabloids in the supermarkets. So uh, uh, even my mother was proud because <laughs> I was there on the supermarket checkout counter. Now we have a better video than the original video that you yeah, used to identify right. it. Let's have a look at it. Yes, this is one of the best videos. This comes from the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. And they recorded this uh, big fin squid, which is what we're calling these things off of Hawaii, and you can see the weird arms with their spaghetti-like extensions and the big fins that we got, we used for the name. It's just spectacular. Now you had another um, uh, occurrence where the ROV at sea um, discovered something unique and that video went viral, which led yeah. to more videos of that same species right. come in. Can you tell us what that was? Yeah, what you're seeing on the screen right now is a little octopod that we found on a very deep dive from the Okeanos Explorer in the mid-Pacific. And it was deeper than any other octopods like this and has strange characteristics. A friend of mine saw the, the video and posted on Facebook that I, I shall call you Casper. And, <laughs> and so that name stuck, it's a Casper octopod. And because that went video, that viral, that video went viral, uh, I was contacted by some other researchers who had seen similar animals while they were studying other pro problems. And uh, we put together a paper which included this observation from a German study of uh, manganese nodules. And this is an octopod that's, that's uh, guarding its eggs that are laid on a stalk of a dead sponge that's attached to a manganese nodule. So all those things circled, what are they? Those are what the nodules that I'm talking about. They're, they're potato-sized rocks that are found in the deep sea in some areas and have really important minerals. So there's a lot of talk about mining those. And so the fact that these octopods lay their eggs on uh, things that are attached to these nodules means that uh, mining the nodules could affect the, the life cycle of the octopods. Now we're just almost out of time, but uh, we have a couple more things that we want to cover before we get to some student questions. Okay. Now we saw some um, egg laying there. Yeah. Is that the only observation of egg laying by a cephalopod in the deep sea? It was a really interesting one, again, by the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. 
they are, uh, they dive in Monterey Canyon and can go to the same place over and over again. They saw this octopod that was guarding our eggs and they were able to go back to the same spot over and over for four years. And they found out that this one mama octopus was taking care of her eggs for four years. So this gets back to the question of how long do they live? This one obviously lives at least four years. Uh, and then finally they, they uh, documented the eggs that had hatched out and that's what you're seeing in the video there. And that's a good mama. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So Mike, can you quickly tell us about a recent project you were, you're working on? I know that you were at sea last month. Yes, I was at sea for about two weeks in the northern Gulf of Mexico, uh, studying the stuff that lives up in the water in the uh, Gulf of Mexico as part of an uh, effort to figure out the, re the effects of the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. And we were using uh, gear that has multiple nets so we could sample different layers in the water column. Uh, when people think about the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, they think about the fact that there was all this ugly oil floating up at the surface. But in addition to the oil at the surface, much of it uh, was trapped at depth at about a thousand meters. And just about all of the natural gas was. And some of that oil settled down onto the bottom and covered deep sea corals and things. But we're trying to find out how all of that affects the water column, the animals that live up in the, the largest ecosystem on earth, which is the deep sea water. Uh, so what discoveries are you making about the animals that live throughout the water column in the largest ecosystem on earth? Uh, among other things, what we're looking at is the basic ecology of these animals. And when we talked about the, the deep ocean, we, we talked about the layers and the, I, we, we talked about the sunlit layer being at the surface and then the twilight zone going from about 200 meters to 1,000 meters and then the really deep ocean, which is where most of the, the living space on Earth is. And we think of that as being really solid lines in between those layers, but it turns out there's a lot of, uh, of overlap. Things move up and down and it's not as distinct as we usually think of it. So that there's, it's more of a gradient than it is distinct layers. Mike, thank you so much for helping us understand a little bit more about cephalopods and shedding a little light on these weird and pretty wonderful creatures that live in the largest ecosystem on Earth. Well, I'm, I'm just really glad you guys are interested. <laughs> How could we not be? Look at these creatures, they're yeah. amazing. Thank you so much, Mike. And two, if you wanna continue your World Ocean Day um, exploration from home, the Nautilus Live and NOAA's Ocean, um, Okeanos Explorer and the Schmidt Marine Institute are all doing a program later this evening, all online. Uh, you can visit Nautilus Live for more information. Mike, thank you so much for being here today on Smithsonian Science How. Yeah. And thank you viewers for tuning in. If you missed part of this program, it'll be archived later this evening on curious.si.edu. And you can find all the resources about these websites on that same URL. Thank you so much for joining us for this season of Smithsonian Science How. We hope to see you next fall uh, when we kick off a brand new lineup of natural history science. See you next time on Science How.